In the following video by Dr. William Lane Craig, which is entitled, Is There Meaning to Life? It is pointed out that if God does not exist, then life has no objective meaning, value, or purpose. Moreover, as Dr. Craig pointed out in the video, and in this following article, many leading atheists, philosophers themselves, agree that life has no objective meaning, value, or purpose if God does not exist. And even though leading atheists themselves agree with Dr. Craig's premise that God is necessary for life to be truly meaningful, atheists choose not to live their life as if it had no meaning and purpose, and in an exercise of self-delusion, choose to create illusory meanings and purposes for their lives. This admittance by leading atheists that they are making up illusory meaning and purposes for their lives underscore, underscores Dr. Craig's main point in his video and in his article. Namely, it is impossible for anyone to live their life both happily and consistently as if life really had no objective meaning or purpose. Moreover, this act of self-delusion on the part of atheists of making up illusory and meaning and purposes for their lives apparently has an extremely limited beneficial effect for the atheists. For example, there are now studies showing that people who do not believe in dualism and are believe in a immortal soul, are more antisocial and are psychopathic than people who do believe in the soul. On top of that, it is also found that learning and reading about the afterlife and or reading and learning about near-death experiences is generally quite successful not only in reducing suicidal thoughts but also in preventing the deed altogether. In fact, numerous studies have now also shown that faith in God has a tremendous beneficial effect on both our mental and physical well-being. As Professor Andrew Sims, former president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists states, the advantageous effect of religious belief on, and spirituality on mental and physical health is one of the best kept secrets in psychiatry and medicine generally. In the majority of studies, re religious involvement is correlated with well-being, happiness, and life satisfaction, hope and optimism, purpose and meaning in life. In fact, in the following study it was found that those middle-aged adults who go to church, synagogues, mosques, or other houses of worship reduce their mortality risk by 55%. Thus, it is readily apparent that the atheist attempt to create illusory meaning and purposes for its life, minus belief in God in the afterlife, falls short in a rather dramatic fashion on both the mental and physical level. Whereas conversely, Dr. Craig's contention that belief in God and immortality are necessary for us to live happily and consistently is in fairly over-the-top fashion, empir empirically validated by all of the preceding evidence. It is also important to point out that it is, for all intents and purposes, virtually impossible for atheists to live as if 
atheist, atheistic materialism were actually true and as if their lives were completely devoid of any true meaning and purpose. As the following article states, Nobody thinks his daughter is just molecules in motion and nothing but. Nobody thinks the Holocaust was evil, but only in a relative provisional sense. A materialist who lived his life according to his professed convictions, under, understanding himself to have no moral agency at all, seeing his friends and enemies and family as genetically determined robots, wouldn't just be a materialist, he'd be a psychopath. Richard Dawkins himself admitted that it would be quote unquote intolerable for him to live his life as if atheistic materialism were actually true. And in the following article subtitled When Evolutionary Materialists Admit That Their Own Worldview Fails, Nancy Piercy quotes many more leading atheists who honestly admit that it would be impossible for them to live their life as if atheistic materialism were actually true. This impossibility for atheists to live consistently within their stated worldview directly undermines their claim that atheism is true. Specifically, as the following article points out, if it is impossible for you to live your life consistently as if atheistic materialism were actually true, then atheistic materialism cannot possibly reflect reality as it really is, but atheistic materialism must instead be based on a delusion. Another self-defeating argument that atheists try to employ in order to claim that life has no objective meaning or purpose is what is termed the argument from the evil. Specifically, in the argument from evil, the atheists hold that there exists a large number of horrible forms of evil and suffering for which we can see no greater purpose or compensating good. And yet, this is, once again, a self-defeating position for the atheist to be in. Specifically, on the one hand, atheist materialists hold that morality is subjective and illusory. And yet, on the other hand, as David Wood points out in the following article, by declaring that suffering is evil, atheists have admitted that there is an objective moral standard by which we distinguish good and evil. Thus, in their argument from evil, atheists have actually conceded the existence of a objective moral standard to judge by and have, once again, refuted atheistic materialism in the process. Simply put, if good and evil really do exist, as the atheist holds in his argument from evil, then God necessarily exists. As Michael Agnor states in the following article, even to raise the problem of evil is to tactically acknowledge transcendent standards and thus to acknowledge God's existence. From that starting point, theodicy begins. Theists have explored it profoundly. Atheists lack the standing even to ask the question. C.S. Lewis, who was a former atheist who had converted to Christianity, clearly puts the fatal flaw inherent in the argument from evil like this. My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. 
what was I comparing the universe with when I called it unjust? If there were no light in the universe and therefore no creature with eyes, we should never know it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. Moreover, the specific philosophical claim from atheists that there exists a large number of horrible forms of evil and suffering for which we can see no greater purpose or compensating good. That particular philosophical claim from atheists is directly refuted in Christian theology by what is termed the beatific vision of heaven. That is to say, as and as the following article shows, that the argument from evil is refuted by the perfect salvation of our immortal souls and or by the existence of heaven. As St. Paul once said, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And even as Jesus himself stated, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? Thus, the atheist, in his argument from evil, basically ignores all of Christian theology in order to try to claim that he can see no greater purpose for God allowing evil and suffering to exist in this world. To sum it up thus far, the atheist contention that life has no objective meaning, value, or purpose is refuted, number one, by the fact that atheists themselves are not able to live consistently as if their lives truly did not have any meaning or purpose, and is also refuted by Number two, the fact that atheists themselves concede the reality of the objective morality in their argument from evil and is also refuted by number three, God himself used evil to bring about, bring about a greater purpose that is inherent in Christ's resurrection from the dead. Moreover, besides philosophical argumentation, empirical science itself provides much more evidence so as to back up the, Christian, the Christians claim that our lives really do have objective meaning and purpose. For instance, another place where atheists try to claim that our lives have no real meaning or purpose is with the Copernican principle and or the principle of mediocrity. Specifically, the principle of mediocrity assumes that nothing is special about humanity's situation. Stephen Hawking, via the Copernican principle and or the principle of medio mediocrity, once stated, the human race is just chemical scum on a moderate-sized planet orbiting around a very average star in the outer suburb of one among a hundred billion galaxies. We are so insignificant that I can't believe the whole universe exists for our benefit. And yet, despite the fact that practically everybody including the vast majority of Christians, hold that the Copernican principle, and by default the principle of mediocrity, are unquestionably true, the plain fact of the matter is that the Copernican principle has now been overturned by both general relativity and quantum mechanics, which happen to be two of our very best, most precisely tested, theories ever in the history of science. Einstein himself stated that the two sentences, the sun is at rest and the earth moves, or the sun moves and the earth is at rest, would simply mean two different conventions concerning two different coordinate systems. 
and Brad Hoyle and George Ellis add their considerable weight here in regards to general relativity overturning the Copernican Principle. As Einstein himself noted, there simply is no experimental test that can be performed that can prove that the Earth is not the center of the universe. Even Stephen Hawking himself, who once claimed that we are just chemical scum on a, an insignificant planet, stated that it is not true that Copernicus proved Ptolemy wrong. The real advantage of the Copernican system is simply that the equations of motion are much simpler in the frame of reference in which the sun is at rest. In fact, in the four-dimensional space-time of Einstein's general relativity, it is left completely open for whomever is making a model of the universe to decide for themselves what is to be considered central in the universe. Even individual people can be considered central in the universe in the four-dimensional space-time of Einstein's general relativity. Moreover, when Einstein first formulated both special and general relativity, he gave a hypothetical observer a privileged frame of reference in which to make measurements in the universe. Whereas, on the other hand, in quantum mechanics, it is the measurement itself that gives each observer a privileged frame of reference in the universe. As the following researcher commented, it proves that measurement is everything. At the quantum level, reality does not exist if you are not looking at it. Moreover, Steven Weinberg himself, an atheist, noted that in quantum mechanics, in what is termed the instrumentalist approach, humans are brought into the laws of physics at the most fundamental level, instead of humans being a result of the laws of physics, as is falsely imagined in Darwinian evolution. Needless to say, atheists don't like the instrumentalist approach of quantum mechanics since it, by letting free will into the laws of nature at the most fundamental level, directly undermines the Darwinian worldview from within. Yet the instrumentalist approach, in spite of how atheists may personally feel about it, is experimentally confirmed to be true by con contextuality and or by the Koken Spectre Theorem. In regards to contextuality, we find that in the quantum world, the property that you discover through measurement is not the property that the system actually had prior to the measurement process. What you observe necessarily depends on how you carried out your the observation and measurement outcomes depend on all the other measurements that are performed, the full context of the experiment. Contextuality means that quantum measurements cannot be thought of as simply revealing some pre-existing property of the system under study. And as Anton Zeilinger states in the following video, what we perceive as reality now depends on our earlier decision what to measure, which is a very, very deep message about the nature of reality and our part in the whole universe. We are not just passive observers. Because of such evidence as this from quantum mechanics, Richard Con Henry, who is a professor of physics at John Hopkins University, stated that it is 
More than 80 years since the discovery of quantum mechanics gave us the most fundamental insight ever into our nature. The overturning of the Copernican Revolution and the restoration of us human beings to centrality in the universe. Moreover, on top of the overturning of the Copernican Principle by both general relativity and quantum mechanics, in the following video, physicist Neil Turek states that we live in the middle or at the geometric mean between the largest scale in physics and the smallest scale in physics. And here's a picture that gets his point across very clearly. Thus, besides both quantum mechanics and general relativity overturning the Copernican principle, the, central, the centrality of life in the universe is also established by yet another fairly impressive angle in physics in which life is found to be at the geometric mean, or quote-unquote, the middle of the universe. Moreover, besides this fairly compelling evidence from physics, in, in molecular biology we find that every molecule in our bodies is literally screaming to us that we have objective meaning, value, and purpose for our lives. As Professor of Physiology Dennis Noble notes in the following article, it is virtually impossible to speak of li living beings for any length of time without using teleological and normative language. Words like goal, purpose, meaning, correct, incorrect, success, failure. And in the following article, Stephen Talbot challenges scientists and philosophers to pose a single topic for biological research, doing so in language that avoids all implications of agency, cognition, and purposiveness. And this working biologist agrees with Talbot's assessment and states, we biologists use words that imply intentionality, functionality, strategy, and design in biology. We simply cannot avoid them. Thus, since it is impossible for molecular biologists to speak of mo molecular biology for any length of time without using language that directly implies goal-directed purposes and or teleology, then it is hardly fair for Darwinian atheists such as Richard Dawkins and William Provine to falsely claim, as they do in these following quotes, that there is no ultimate meaning in life and that we live in a universe of nothing but pitiless indifference. In fact, Given the fact that teleology and or goal-directed purpose is so intricately infused into life at such a fundamental level, molecular level, I would hold that it takes a rather large amount of willful intellectual blindness on the part of these evolutionary biologists for them to say that life gives no indication of purpose and meaning. The plain fact of the matter, despite what leading evol evolutionary biologists may say, is that every one of the billion trillion protein molecules in our body screams that we have intrinsic meaning and purpose for our lives. As Stephen Talbot goes on to state in the following article, which happens to be entitled, how biologists lost sight of meaning of life and are now staring it in the face. He states, A given cell typically contains more than a billion protein molecules at any one time. The human body is formed by trillions of individual cells. And then we hear that all this meaningful activity is somehow meaningless or the product of meaninglessness. 
This, I believe, is the real issue troubling the majority of American populace when they are asked about their belief in evolution. They see one thing and then are told, more or less directly, that they are really seeing its denial. Yet no one has ever explained to them how you get meaning from meaninglessness. A difficult enough task once you realize that we cannot, we cannot articulate any knowledge of the world at all except in the language of meaning. And in the following article, Talbot goes even further and reveals that this overwhelming impression of meaning and purpose that is found in life is closely associated with there being information in life while an organism is alive. Specifically, Talbot states that at the moment of an organism's death, code, information, and communication in their biological sense will have disappeared from the scientist's vocabulary. And yet, this immaterial information that Talbot refers to that is keeping an organism alive for precisely for a lifetime and not a moment longer also provides empirical evidence for a transcendent soul that is capable of living beyond the death of our temporal material bodies. These following two videos go over some of that evidence for immaterial information. Simply put, quantum information, which is now found to be pervasive within molecular biology, and of which classical information is now found to be a subset. This quantum information is conserved, which simply means, unlike classical information, quantum information cannot be destroyed. The implication of conserved quantum information and biology is fairly straightforward, as Stuart Hameroff states in the following video. But the quantum information isn't destroyed. It can't be destroyed. It's possible that this quantum information can exist outside the body, perhaps indefinitely, as the soul. Thus, immaterial quantum information that is now found to be pervasive within molecular biology provides empirical evidence strongly suggesting that each of us do indeed have a mortal soul that is capable of living beyond the death of our temporal material bodies, and thus also provides empirical evidence strongly supporting Dr. Craig's philosophical claim that belief in a mortal soul is required for us to live happily and consistently in this present world. Another way that atheists try to argue that man has no objective meaning and purpose for his life is by trying to undermine the Judeo-Christian belief in human exceptionalism. That is to say, atheists try to undermine the belief that we, of all the creatures on earth, are alone, uniquely made in the image of God. Charles Darwin himself argued that the difference in mind between man and the higher animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree and not of kind. And yet, this following paleoanthropologist strongly disagrees with Darwin's assessment. Specifically, he states, we are unique and alone now in the world. There is no other animal species that truly resembles our own. A physical and mental chasm separates us from all other living creatures. This is not a question of degree. It is all or nothing. There is no semi-bipedal animal, none that makes only small fires, 
writes only short sentences, builds only rudimentary spaceships, draws just a little, or prays only occasionally. And indeed, as the following video series shows, the purported evidence for human evolution is far weaker than many Darwinists have possibly portrayed it to be to the general public. Moreover, in 2014, a group of leading evolutionary scientists themselves also strongly disagreed with Charles Darwin's assessment of the human situation and stated that after four decades of intense research, they have essentially no explanation of how and why our linguistic computations and representations evolved. Best-selling author Tom Wolfe was so shocked by this honest confession by leading Darwinists that he wrote a book on the subject. Wolf summed up his main argument in his book in the following quote, In a hand to paw, hand to claw, or hand to incisor combat, any animal his size would have him for lunch. Yet man owns and controls them all. Every animal that exists, thanks to his superpower, speech. Simply put, Although humans are fairly defenseless creatures in the wild compared to other creatures such as bears, lions, and sharks, etc., nonetheless humans have, completely contrary to the Darwinian survival of the fittest thinking, managed to somehow become masters of the planet, not by brute force, but simply by our unique ability to communicate information and, more specifically, by our ability to infuse information into material substrates in order to create tools and objects that are extremely useful for our defense, for our shelter, and for growing and hunting food, etc., etc. What is more interesting still, besides the fact that humans have a unique ability to understand and create information, and have come to master the planet through this top-down infusion of information into material substrates is the fact that due to advances in science both the universe and life itself are now found to be information theoretic in their foundational basis. Renowned physicist John Wheeler stated that in short all matter and all things physical are information theoretic in origin, and this is a participatory universe. And in the following article, Anton Zollinger, a leading expert in quantum mechanics, stated that it may very well be said that information is the irreducible kernel from which everything else flows. And in the following video at the 48 minute mark, Anton Zeilinger goes on to state that it is operationally impossible to separate reality and information. And he then goes on to note at the 50 minute mark the theological significance of John 1 1, which states, In the beginning was the Word. And Dr. Uh, Bedra, who is a professor of physics at the University of Oxford and is, who is also a recognized leader in the field of quantum mechanics states, the most fundamental definition of reality is not matter or information, not matter or energy, but information. And it is the processing of information that lies at the root of all physical, biological, economic and social phenomena. Moreover, besides being foundational to physical reality, information, as intelligent design advocates have been pointing out to Darwinists for years, is also to be uh, found to be 
infused into biological life at a very fundamental level. All in all, it is hard to imagine a more convincing scientific proof that we are made in the image of God and that our lives therefore have meaning and purpose than finding both the universe and life itself or information theoretic in their foundational basis and that we, of all the creatures on earth, uniquely possess an ability to understand and create information and moreover have come to ma master the pl planet precisely because of our unique ability to infuse information into material substrates. Perhaps a more convincing proof that we are made in the image of God and that our lives truly do have meaning and purpose could be if God, uh, God himself became a man defeated death on the cross, and then rose from the dead to prove that he was indeed God. And that just so happens to be precisely the claim of Christianity. As Dr. Craig stated at the end of his Is There Meaning to Life video, if Christianity is true, then each one of us is here for a reason, and life does not end at the grave. And God is the absolute standard of goodness. He knows you. He loves you. And He intentionally created you. So your life does have objective meaning, value, and purpose. That means you can live a life that is both happy and consistent. And here are a few videos that, in my honest opinion, provide fairly compelling evidence that Christianity is indeed true. Thus in conclusion, on top of Dr. Craig's very persuasive philosophical argument, we can now add a fairly impressive amount of empirical evidence that, in over-the-top fashion, confirms Dr. Craig's philosophical argument that our lives do indeed have objective meaning, value, and purpose. Well, that's the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching. And again, all videos and papers that have been referenced in this video may be accessed in the link that is provided in the video description. Thank you again for watching.